Jason Riley, and I'm a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to today's conference, uh, Barriers to Black Progress. Uh, this is my fourth year uh, hosting a uh, conference uh, on race-related issues for the Manhattan Institute. Um, and when my colleagues and I sat down a few months ago to start planning this one, uh, I can assure you that we had no idea how much material we would have to work with based on recent events. Um, it's occurred to me that we could do an entire conference based on what's happening in Virginia this week. Um, but, but that's my point. Uh, that's what's different about what we're attempting to do here today. Uh, so much of the discussion about racial inequality uh, gets hung up on these sorts of things. Uh, a medical school yearbook page with photos of people in KKK costumes and blackface. A governor and state attorney general darkening their skin to imitate black celebrities. At college parties back in the 1980s. A congressman from Iowa who promotes neo-Nazis on Twitter and tells the New York Times there's nothing wrong with using terms like white supremacy and white nationalists. A president who picks fights with black athletes on social media and gratuitously uses the most disparaging language imaginable to describe illegal immigrants from south of the border. Of course, none of this should be ignored by the media. It's all legitimate news. But does it explain racial inequality in America? Or more specifically, to what extent does it explain racial inequality? Do episodes like the ones I just described and countless others explain our persistent racial gaps in everything from income to home ownership to educational attainment to employment? Does it explain why our jails and prisons are teeming with young black and brown men? Well, the prevailing wisdom is that they do. That's the prevailing view in the media, in academia, and among our politicians and public policymakers. Among social activists, it's taken as a given. Civil rights groups spend most of their time scouring the nation for sightings of Confederate flags and use of the N-word by white people. In most of our discussions about racial inequality today, the assumption is that racism, by and large, explains racial disparities. That's the starting point. Many people have convinced themselves that evidence of ongoing racial bias proves beyond any doubt that racism in America today remains the major barrier to black progress. Whether other factors play a bigger role is a question seldom asked, let alone investigated with any rigor. In fact, to even ask such a question is enough to earn the wrath of those who believe racism is an all-purpose explanation for bad black outcomes in America today. Well, I don't think that's the prevailing view among the people you'll hear from today. We're going to ask the questions that others don't want to consider. Now, no one here believes that racism is a thing of the past in America. Most reasonable people agree that it still exists. Uh, nor am I arguing that racism, that the racism that blacks have endured over the centuries and continue to endure today, has no bearing at all on racial inequities. It's not a question of whether racial bias is a negative factor. The relevant question is, to what degree is it a factor? The relevant question is whether the racism that does still exist adequately explains the racial gaps we see today, or whether other factors, namely cultural factors, offer more plausible explanations of what we're experiencing. Another problem with too many of our discussions about racial inequality today is that they are often driven by emotion and political correctness, which is understandable but not particularly helpful when trying to come up with ways to improve matters. Anecdotes too often substitute for facts and evidence. Or evidence is cherry-picked in order to drive a certain narrative. 
One of the best examples of this is the debate over police shootings that has gripped our country in recent years. Journalists these days state matter-of-factly that there is an epidemic in this country of trigger-happy cops gunning for black people. Protesters have marched in the streets. Pro-athletes have refused to stand for the national anthem. An entire movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, has arisen from this narrative. But is there any empirical data to support it? Well, here in New York City, we have the nation's largest population and largest police force. The NYPD has kept detailed records on police shootings since 1971. That year, in 1971, police shot 314 people, 91 of them fatally. Two decades later, the number of police shootings in New York had fallen from 314 to 108, and fatalities had fallen from 93 to 27. Last night, I looked up the most recent figures we have, which are from 2017. In 2017, New York City police shot 19 people, 10 of them fatally. It's the lowest number on record. So we're talking about a roughly 90% reduction in police shootings and police shooting fatalities in the nation's largest city, the nation's largest police force, over the past four and a half decades. And New York is no outlier here. Police shootings have fallen dramatically nationwide in other large cities over the past half century. In 2017, police in Los Angeles shot 15 people. Police in Chicago shot 25 people, which represented less than 1% of all shootings in Chicago that year. Meanwhile, we have social activists claiming that police shootings are not only rising, but have reached epidemic proportions. This is just one of many examples of how a prevailing narrative can be almost completely divorced from the empirical data. But if we want to begin to do something about racial inequities in this country, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to correct the false narratives that so often drive the discussions. And that brings me to our featured guest, Professor Glenn Lowry of Brown University, whom I'd like to invite up here to join me now for a brief discussion. Professor Lowry is a, is a truth teller extraordinaire. Uh, he's an economist by training. He's also taught at Harvard and Boston University. So he has an appreciation for facts and data and logic and empiricism. He's also published several books on race, including one titled The Anatomy of Racial Inequality and another titled Race, Incarceration, and American Values. Professor Lowry wrote a provocative paper for today's conference titled, Culture, Causation, and Responsibility, Some Reflections on the Persistence of Racial Inequality in 21st Century America. And I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing some of the major themes he explores. I hope you can, can you all still hear me? OK, thank you. So Professor, let's. Uh, Let's start with that title, uh, Culture, Causation, and Responsibility. Um, if we were sitting uh, in the studio at CNN or in a lecture hall at Wellesley and tried to discuss culture and responsibility at a conference on racial inequality, I submit to you that Armed guards would escort us to the exits. <laughs> uh, do you disagree? Only, only slightly. I mean, I do, uh, at Brown University, where I'm a professor, uh, teach a course called Race and Inequality in the United States. It's ongoing right now. And I started with a review of some of the data that are uh, reflected in this paper about the extent of racial inequality. And I challenge people straight ahead. I say, you know, What's the cause of this? Okay, So there are various stories out there. And one of the stories is an unrelenting, overbearing, white supremacist society won't give black people a chance. And I asked them, 
do you believe that seven in 10 black children born to a woman without a husband, that fact is due to an unrelenting white supremacy? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that homicide victimization and homicide perpetration at an order of magnitude higher rate amongst African American young men as compared to similar white men is a, how? Explain to me, tell me what the causation is. I, I challenge it. But, but they're saying and they don't why? riot. My point yeah, is they don't yeah, riot. Yeah. I mean, they are a little bit stunned mm -hmm. because they're not hearing that kind of uh, challenge uh, in most of their classes. But I'd say 60, 70 percent of them are challenged by it. They're, they're not, you know, just reflexively dismissive of it. Now, among the activists who are not in my classroom, <laughs> <laughs> But if we were to invite you, heaven forbid, <laughs> to come and give a lecture, would be present in large numbers. <laughs> There's a different story. There's no, as it were, talking to some of those people. But I'd say you just draw a kid at Brown University at random. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, it's not out, of out of the question that you can uh, get them to take seriously some of these kinds of things. Well, let's talk about some of the arguments they make. Um, because uh, to be fair, Many of even the activists don't deny the antisocial behavior that we see among particularly uh, low income uh, minorities. Um, but they say, before we start talking about that, before we start talking about black behavior, we need to talk about white behavior. We've got governors in blackface, we've got congressmen spouting off about white nationalism. Professor? Why are you talking to me about out of wedlock childbirth? That is the real problem. Until we can eliminate that, don't talk to me about learning gaps uh, and, and, and the black role in that. We, we, we can't get there yet until we handle this issue with white people. They need to get their act together. Don't talk to black people about getting their act together first. What a horrible argument that is. <laughs> No, I understand that people are going to make it. Yes, that will be said. That's somewhat of a caricature, but not much. Um, and what a horrible argument that is. Uh, you just made white people, the ones whom you say are the implacable, racist, uh, indifferent, don't care uh, oppressors, into the sole agents of your own delivery. Really? If they are, in fact, so racist, What's the point in talking to them? I, I, I mean, that, that, there's just a uh, straight up logical contradiction in that posture. Uh, the oppressor is going to be the agent of my delivery if only I could get him or her to respond effectively to my moral appeals. I don't follow that at all. Now, as a matter of fact, I don't buy the hypothesis, the hypothesis being that uh, the fact that um, the uh, culture of Jim Crow segregation and uh, white domination in um, some parts of American society had a long, long, um, you know, uh, shadow that could be seen even in the decades of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in American society reflected in the fact that some prominent Democrats in Virginia <laughs> would appear to have been participants in a remnant of that. That's true. As an African American, I'm not especially you know, happy about that. But it's hardly a, an implacable force holding you back. And what I have to say to such people, and I expect that um, there may be some here who would find this uh, uh, problematic, but what I have to say to such people is grow up. Nobody's coming to save you. Grow up. You're just dodging your responsibility. You're just looking for an excuse. And uh, sadly, too many in the establishment, in the media, in the academy, and so on, are willing to play along. But you know what? When it comes to their children and their lives, they'll defend the uh, norms of decency and civil behavior that they know are essential to the development and the success of people whom they care about. But when it comes to you and your people, uh, they're willing to nod along with your nonsense. Grow up. But uh, we're not. <clears throat> I mean, these are people in position of authority, positions of power, congressmen, governors, uh, business owners. Yeah. Um, and the argument is that they run the system by and large. And they are in a position to hold people back, to discriminate on a systematic uh, 
in a systematic way, and that that is what explains these racial disparities that we see. I mean, you're, you're an economist. You deal uh, in, 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 in facts and data, empiricism, logic. Uh, we've, we have persistent statistical gaps in this country. They've been around for a long time. Is that in and of itself evidence of racism? But for racism, would we see more racial parity when it comes to home ownership or income or education levels? Because that is one of the arguments uh, being made out there. Well, that's why I say c culture causation and responsibility, because the causation question is important. It's a difficult question. It's a matter of social science analysis, but it's, it's really very important. Um, so the way I look at it is, I mean, there are basically two narratives uh, that people concerned about c persisting racial inequality can adapt, uh, can adopt. Uh, one of them is a biased narrative of the sort that you're uh, outlining here. You know, uh, racism and white supremacy have done us wrong. Uh, we won't be able to get ahead until they relent. Uh, we have to continue to press for uh, reform of American society, of white American society to that end. But the other narrative, which I take very seriously and for which I think there's a ton of evidence, I'm calling the development narrative. I'm saying that you have to look at the processes by which people come to acquire skills, traits, habits, and orientations that uh, lend themselves to successful participation in American society. And to the extent that African American youngsters, too many of them, certainly not all, um, are not having the experiences and being exposed to the influences and having the benefit of the resources that foster and facilitate human development, so much so that the statistics that you were alluding to are what they are, to that extent that they are not developed, that they're not achieving their full human potential, uh, that is basically the cause for the gaps that we're seeing. And you know, these two different, crudely, uh, different orientations or predispositions point in two very different directions in terms of intervention and remedy. The first is white America must reform itself. We need more of this or that, whatever the this or that is of the latter day agenda of the race reformers. We need more of this or we need more of that. White America must reform itself. Racism must end. You see it in the New York Times every day. Um, the other, however, the development narrative, both puts more onus on the responsibilities of African Americans to be engaged in the processes that lead to uh, the development of full human potential, and points towards solving the actual problems, uh, rather than uh, this uh, kind of wishful argument. If we could double the budget for this program, then the homicide rate amongst young African American males would go down. If we can get this police officer or this police department under the investigation of the Department of Justice or convicted for their wrongful acts, then, then what? Then it'll be safe to walk around on the south side of Chicago at 1 o'clock in the, in the morning? Uh, well, 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 that, that that's leads wishful me, thinking. Well, you made two arguments here. One is that self-development needs to, to take place among these groups. But to what extent can politicians or public policy abet that self-development? We've had um, uh, black elected officials uh, black police chiefs, twice elected black president, black school superintendents, principals. Um, do, do these sort of problems you're describing lend themselves to political solutions or solutions that can be put forward by public policymakers? Uh, is that where our focus should be? Well, most, in my mind, of the public policy initiatives and activities aimed at improving life chances for disadvantaged people should not and need not be formulated in racial terms or understood as a remedy for racial inequality. We need to figure out as a society what the character of our social obligations should be one to another, what makes sense, what does morality require, what does pragmatic uh, uh, practical wisdom and uh, human judgment suggest, I'm talking about everything from health care to education to uh, uh, income support for indigenous families to uh, indigent families and so on. Uh, we need to figure out what works for America's disadvantaged people, period. If we get that right, um, and you know, we're, we've been working on it for some time, that is the shaping of the American welfare state consistent with our own demographic, 
graphic realities and our own values and our fiscal capacities, we get that right, we'll go a very long way toward, uh, I think, uh, uh, assisting African Americans to be able to develop our full human potential. Uh, but one area that I'd point to in specific, and Ian Rowe is here, we're gonna be hearing from him, is education. And I, I think that there is a, a obviously very large footprint that public policy at the federal, state, and local level has in the provision of educational services to young people. And I think it's demonstrable that on the whole, for disadvantaged African Americans concentrated in large cities and largely uh, minority majority school districts uh, served by public employees who are on the whole, um, I assume decent people doing the best that they can, but based on assessment of the outcomes, maybe not doing as best as can be done, mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge area for policy uh, with respect to charter schools, increasing uh, uh, the um, options that parents have to avail themselves of. My, my son, Alden, who lives in Chicago, has two children in the Chicago public schools, and I can tell you he and his wife, both of whom are college graduates and professional people, spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about how to get their kids educated, um, navigating the, the ins and outs of the, of the system there. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, there's plenty of room there, but you know, I mean, I, I'm talking to Jason Riley, I know you know, uh, that there are huge political forces standing in the way of that happening. Mm -hmm. And I find it profoundly ironic that you look across African American politics, you don't see any argument. It's, it's not like I expect everybody to agree with me. I don't. Mm -hmm. But you don't see any argument. Mm -hmm. There is a virtual uni unanimous uh, stance, in the case at hand, I'm talking about education, in favor of the National Education Association's basic uh, platform on these issues, uh, hostile to charter schools. A couple of years ago, the NAACP's board meeting in Cincinnati was, in effect, uh, attacked or overwhelmed by African American parents coming to protest the fact that the NAACP board was about to sign on to a resolution opposing funding for charter schools or exposing the expansion of funding for charter schools in the various states. Uh, but you don't see any political uh, engagement with these fundamental questions. Likewise, on the issue of are the cops good or bad for the security and safety of African-American lives in American urban environments? What a profoundly important and significant question. Where is the debate amongst African-Americans effective at the political level? Where's the challenge to uh, sitting uh, congressperson uh, Maxine Waters or somebody like that? And, you know, I mean, I don't mean to make this personal, but uh, really? Uh, here we are now, a half century after the 1960s, and there's no debate amongst African Americans about the lack of the effectiveness of these tried uh, yeah. and uh, shop-worn and ineffective uh, uh, stances that people are taking. I thought you cared about black lives. You're forcing me to the conclusion that you don't give a damn about black lives. What you care about is the New York Times editorial page. That's what you care about. You don't care about black lives. If you cared about black lives, you'd actually be out there arguing with people over this question of how do I secure the safety of person and property of people in places like the South Bronx or on the west side of Chicago or whatever, because there's an argument to be had. It is far from self-evident. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the paper, you also talk about social media today and its ability to frame our conversations about race and racial inequality uh, and the role it plays in, in, in pushing a narrative, which seems to be what's most important, owning the narrative, uh, regardless of whether you have the facts on your side. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I was speculating. It's not as if I have this one nailed or anything like that, but it seems plausible to me. Plausible to me. So an incident will happen somewhere. Starbucks in Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken. Two black men asked to leave the restaurant after uh, getting into a dispute with the manager. The incident then becomes a, an event, and the event becomes a cause. And it's all around this idea that that incident is somehow emblematic or representative of the experience of African American. It resonates with the bias narrative. Here we have the incident. Now, what makes the incident even exist? It's that information about it gets spread instantly and quickly among people. People react to that information about it, post on Facebook, tweets on Twitter, and so forth and so on. And suddenly now we have a cost celeb. Now we have a uh, larger than the actual objective, uh, you know, relative frequency, whatever. Likewise, uh, 
uh, police officer shoots an unarmed African American who's fleeing and shoots them in the back. That then becomes the face of the experience of African Americans with police. Hundreds of thousands of people will now start taking their children aside and having a conversation with them about a purported threat that uh, they face out, out there without any real statistical validation of the relative frequency of incidents of this kind. And it seems to me that uh, the social media does facilitate that. Um, I, I say in the paper that it's not that people know about the event. It's not that the event happened and people know about it. It's that people know about other people knowing about it so that when I come to the cocktail party, it's a trope. It, it becomes a kind of uh, a shorthand reference to a generic phenomenon of uh, African-American oppression, suppression, exclusion, and so forth that people can then draw on knowing that others will understand the meaning of their reference to these events. It was that kind of uh, idea I was getting at. What about the role that um, intellectuals, uh, academics, people who deal, uh, public thinkers, uh, people who deal in the world of ideas, what explains their reluctance to go there in terms of talking about the role that culture plays in inequality in this country? Uh, we all know about the Moynihan Report, what happened to him. Uh, when he talked about what was going on with the black family, but we are 50 years past that. Uh, why is there such a hesitancy still today to talk about what is so obvious? I mean, you look at the, the, the we, we, it's, you know, causation is hard to prove, but the strong correlations yeah. between a father being in the home and a kid staying out of finishing school, a girl not getting pregnant uh, as, as a teenager, uh, uh, staying out of prison, uh, all, strong correlations between these things. What explains the, 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 the reluctance of, 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 the, of your colleagues to honestly have these discussions in this day and age? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. I'm not sure I know. Uh, I would speculate that part of it is virtue signaling. One, you know, you're in an equilibrium, we economists would say, where certain kinds of speech acts have a connotation uh, that is negative. Only certain kinds of people would say that thing. So when the, econ when the society is very polarized and where you have uh, people whom we know are arch enemies of our interest, you know, at Breitbart.com or whatever it might be, uh, who we know don't like black people saying certain things, if you are an African American or someone who wants to be thought of as very friendly to African American interests, you risk when you repeat things that are like what's being said by the known racist or similar to them, you risk uh, devaluation of your, uh, uh, you know, a set of the assessment people are prepared to make about you as being committed to the cause. Uh, so there's a kind of, this is my theory of political correctness, actually, what I think political correctness is at the end of the day is um, a cul-de-sac, a kind of cognitive and intellectual cul-de-sac where we were trapped by the need to not seem to be on the wrong side of history and therefore saying things that we may not even believe ourselves, many of us deep down, but that we know are the things expected of us to be said. Uh, so I, I think it's something like that, at least for many people it's something like that. Uh, for other people I think it is a um, uh, it is a technique, and in effect, it's a dare, or I'm calling it a bluff in the paper. The people know, uh, you know, I'm sure many people who are friends of the Black Lives Matter movement know that the cops are, on the whole, the uh, principal line of defense of black lives against the depredation of a relatively few violent people. They know that. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, uh, they, they, they dare you, they're in effect daring you to disagree with them in public about it because they're relying upon being able to, um, to uh, um, smear you as uh, a person who, uh, you know, in virtue of the fact that you were point to the good that the cops are doing must not be on the right side of history. This kind of, they're, they're counting on us backing down when uh, confronted about calling attention to the absence of black fathers. The, uh, and, and, and by the way, there are other issues besides race. There is uh, gender and uh, so forth. There, there is uh, the left-right debate about how you organize society, the economy, the so whatever. So you have ideologues of a variety of stripes who are allied together and they're kind of, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. 
I will not say anything about the negative consequences of unrestricted illegal immigration coming across the southern border if you promise not to talk about how many of the black babies in uh, Chicago don't have daddies. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, I mean, I, I have a theory as to why there's a hesitancy out there for these various groups um, to speak honestly about these things. I think with the, with the civil rights folks and the activists, um, they become less relevant if they acknowledge that, that racism is not, does not play the role it once did in holding blacks back. Um, and with our politicians, um, I don't think there's anything to be gained um, by uh, having an honest discussion here. If you're a politician, you tell people what they want to hear, if not, not necessarily what they need to hear about these things. And you tell them that um, uh, I've got a, a government program here that can solve Solve your problem, and, and that's the way you win votes. Uh, I, I was recently. Uh, I'm wrote, sorry, Jason. I'm sorry. Man. That's just no. What you do? No, that's, that's, well, that's what they do. Me, that's cowardice. That's let cowardice. Let me give you an example. Public irresponsibility. I'll give you a, a, a very recent example. Um, sure. There are some uh, YouTube videos out there of Kamala Harris as a prosecutor uh, in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, Ten years ago. Yeah. You should listen to the way she used to talk about some of these issues. She, there's, there's a speech of her in Chicago talking about how she gets tired of these progressives talking about, you know, build fewer prisons and more schools. She, she mocks them. She says, hey, in principle, I agree with you, but you have an address why I have three padlocks on my front door. Kamala Harris doesn't talk like that anymore. Yeah. And it's because that is not the route to the White House. That is not the route to the nomination. That is, that is not in her interest to talk like that anymore. I'm not sure about that, but that's easy for me to say. I'm not a politician trying to get elected. I'm not, I remember during the primary campaign in 2016, Bill Clinton was giving a speech somewhere. I think it was in Philadelphia again. And he got confronted by a bunch of activists who's calling him out about the uh, omnibus crime bill of 1994. And he said to them, in effect, tell the truth. Tell the truth. You weren't there. Okay? It was a... S-H-I-T storm, okay? We did the best that we could. In retrospect, we might have done a little bit differently, this or that, but you're gonna call me a racist because I was trying to take care of my responsibilities? Tell the truth, tell the truth. Now, it was reported later as a gaffe. <laughs> Clinton once again goes off script and hurts the campaign. I'm not persuaded. I mean, look, the way you get to be rich is you have an idea that nobody else has had and you have the balls to put your money where your idea is and you go into that niche in the market and you find out that people want what it is that you're selling. If you're not willing to take a risk, you're not gonna get paid. Isn't that the rules of uh, how, uh, how it works? So likewise here with politics, if you're not willing to take a risk and step out a little bit and challenge people, isn't that what Donald Trump did to a certain degree in 2016? Isn't that why he's president of the United States right now? He made a bet about what he thought that the electorate was going to respond to that nobody else was willing to make. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but I mean, if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Last time I checked, he won that election. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how much time we have left before we're going to have questions. Uh, Okay. Well, let me uh, uh, try and uh, summarize. Can I just say I'm not endorsing everything that Donald Trump is saying? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm endorsing is chutzpah. I'm, what I'm Professor Lowry is the goes off to... script <laughs> and commits a gaffe. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, you, what you seem to be getting at in the paper uh, is that, um, in terms of the theme of this conference, Black Barriers, is that the, the, the focus hasn't been on, to the extent it's needed uh, to be, on, on developing that, that social capital, that human capital among these groups. Um, and, but that, that underdevelopment is a better explanation of the, the racial gaps we see today uh, than is racism. And, 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 and that there are opportunities out there for blacks today more than ever, but they're unable to take advantage of them due to that underdevelopment. Can, can I just say one thing? I know our time is short. Yes, in uh, affirming your summary of where I'm coming from, that's exactly where I come from. I want to give the school discipline uh, uh, example to make this point graphic. So uh, 
Uh, the Obama Department of Education enjoins or strongly recommends or cajoles uh, local school districts around the country to get their racial disparity and suspension rates of students for disruptive behavior in school narrow. Narrow that racial disparity or else you're going to have trouble with the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Education. Uh, along comes Betsy DeVos in the Trump administration and they rescind or walk back some of that advice to much uh, consternation. And listening to that debate, I thought, well, you know, if in fact it's the case that teachers, principals, and guidance counselors and uh, school-based police officers are racially discriminating so that the same behavior amongst African Americans ends up with a tougher sanction like suspension, then that same behavior amongst whites, that would be a problem. It would be something the Office of Civil Rights and so forth that should, should be involved in. But based on all that we know, like, for example, what's the crime participation and incarceration rate of those same populations five years later, it's at least plausible that there's an objective racial disparity in the frequency of disruptive behavior that occasions a difference in the statistics. Now, if that's right, if it's not racism, if it's the behavior of the kids, what a disservice we're doing to those kids to cover up that disruptive behavior uh, under the uh, uh, idea that uh, we're getting civil rights. What a terrible thing to be doing, and not only to them, but to their classmates who came into the school with the intention of learning something, and to the teachers who were doing a very, very difficult job by being in that classroom with these kids, by not willing to back their play, and instead rolling that up into a civil rights thing. That is on the borderline of criminal if, in fact, the reason for the disparity is the disruptive behavior being more frequent amongst, the, yeah. amongst these yeah. lower class African American students. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm saying. I'm saying if you really cared about racial equality, I could go on in this vein. The affirmative action debate. We are now in, and I'll stop because I know our time is limited, but we're now on the verge of enshrining as a permanent device achieving the inclusion and representation of African Americans in elite and selective academic venues through an openly acknowledged use of different standards to judge their performance. That's horrible. It's not horrible because of the 14th Amendment, although the Supreme Court may yet find so. It's horrible because it really isn't equality. It's patronization. It's African Americans embracing and the establishment adopting a set of practices that basically are rooted in the soft bigotry of low expectations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a horrible thing. Yeah. Okay? Not because the Asian kids are being uh, unfairly treated, though they well may be. It's horrible to African Americans ourselves. And again, I ask, where's the debate? Yeah. Other than uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and uh, uh, Professor Thomas Sowell and a few others, there's not even a debate yeah. amongst African Americans about a first order question if the goal is equality. Um, we're going to open it up to questions, uh, if there are any out there. The lights are very bright here, so maybe someone can choose. Uh, go ahead. Uh. Um, let me just start with a question. Uh, thank you, Tim Kohler. Um, Professor Lowry, given that you're spending most of your time at, in an academic institution, um, do you feel that the students who you teach, do they come out with a more thoughtful perspective? Do you, are, are we able to convince them? Because my experience with college students is that they're somehow come out brainwashed. Um, or do you think you're making progress? And what else can we do in college to, to sort of get people to get the students to think more critically about some of these issues? We need more faculty who are open to considering these issues from a broad range of perspectives. Uh, it, it, the ideological diversity, ideological diversity of people who are in positions like my own to uh, design these classes and put, put these lectures forward and invite these speakers and so on is very one-sided left. And we need more ideological diversity amongst the faculty. Um, I, as I said, in my experience at Brown, the, there's a broad uh, swath of students, I am, I'm going to guess like 50, 60 percent, who are not completely closed-minded and are uh, surprised and stimulated by hearing arguments of the sort that I'm putting in front of them. And when I put those arguments in front of them, I acknowledge that, you know, I'm voicing an opinion. Uh, this is my assessment based upon, uh, you know, what I've seen and, and the thoughts that I've had. My mouth is not a prayer book. Uh, you should feel free to disagree and take issue and let's talk about it. That the goal, the goal of the class here is to uh, train ourselves for a disciplined, fact-based, reason-mediated uh, uh, disputation. Uh, 
uh, not uh, to uh, you know uh, you know induct you into the inner sanctum of the politically correct, uh, and not to berate and and uh, uh, you know uh, from a from a right of center point of view if that's where I'm coming from, but rather to figure out how we can engage these questions in a serious way. And I'm not, you know, Heather McDonald, and, uh, who I uh, admire and respect, and I uh, don't entirely agree about this, as I understand her. Uh, the Diversity Delusion is her most recent book, and uh, this sense that academia is a completely lost cause. It's a, it's a heavy lift, I'll grant you that, but I don't think it's a completely lost cause, because as I say, I think there is a substantial plurality of uh, students who are interested in uh, thinking uh, seriously and being challenged in their thought uh, about uh, questions that they take to be vitally important. Yeah. So I, I would not write off institutions of higher education completely, but we desperately need to broaden the uh, range of uh, thinking amongst the people who are responsible for, for setting the stage at such institutions. Good morning. Um, my name is Clayton Banks. I'm the founder and CEO of Silicon Harlem but I'm speaking for my own self. <laughs> and I want to thank the Manhattan Institute for this great um, event. Professor Lowry, I, I'm very impressed with your you know, perspective. I think I may go a little bit further than you. I, for one, believe that race is a myth and that it's just simply a social construct. So when you, where I think I would argue with you is when you identify yourself as African American, I just want to, I, to me, I think we all have to figure out then what does that mean? What do we assign to that? And so my question to you is, I think your point about education is much wider, meaning that we really have to figure out how it, we can disrupt the social construct to realize that we're all the same. And I'm curious what your thoughts are around that. I really, uh, Clayton, I really appreciate that question. And uh, when you read my paper, you'll see that uh, we, we have a lot of common ground on the question of what is race. I spent some time talking about that. Uh, I don't say a myth at the end of the day. I say a social convention uh, that uh, is uh, reinforced in society by the behaviors that people adapt and that has meaning uh, to people, notwithstanding the fact that it is not intrinsically significant. The color of my skin, the, my eyes, the shape of bones in my face, the texture of my hair, these are not telling us anything about the moral significance of human beings. However, we find ourselves socially in a situation where uh, because of mutually reinforcing expectations that individuals have and because of ideas about identity, these markers are, uh, are meaningful uh, for uh, the way in which we interact with each other. So for example, look at uh, the adoption market. Look, look, look at people who are willing to take children into their homes. You will find that race plays a role in that uh, in the sense that uh, the opportunities available to kids depend upon their race and whatnot. Families making decisions about how to constitute themselves they are aware of racial identity. I call myself a black man from the south side of Chicago, born in 1948. Uh, grew up in uh, you know, a segregated neighborhood. Uh, all of my uh, childhood was spent amongst other African American people. When I think about who am I, who do I want to spend my life with as a partner, how do I want my children to identify, and what uh, causes do, do they embrace, that I might uh, have a racial aspect to that in no way, in no way uh, confirms some kind of essentialist idea that you know, race is a, as it were, real thing. In no way does it do that. But it is a conventional and uh, easily understood uh, response. I mean, people will adopt uh, identities based upon the uh, uh, experiences that they've had through the course of their lives and the uh, social markers that are meaningful to them. And uh, in a raced society, that is a society in which racial conventions are an ongoing reality, uh, individual identities rooted in, in such uh, practice are not inexplicable. And I actually don't think they're morally problematic. Uh, they needn't be morally problematic. But this is an important issue because on the one hand, I'm advocating that African Americans take more personal and communal responsibility for the uh, gaps that we, are, uh, that we are aware of, which presupposes some kind of racial identity. Otherwise, who am I talking to? If I say we, African Americans, we need to own this, who am I talking to if I'm not talking to other people who share with me some sense of racial identity? On the other hand, I also say in this paper, that I think at the end of the day, uh, 
uh, the horrible uh, social uh, pathology that we can observe in some quarters of American society is not black pathology, it's American pathology. I want to insist that those people are our people. I want to say for the purposes of politics, policy, and a sense of national purpose that we're one people here in America. I'm against identity politics and its crude manifestations and so on. So I'm, I'm in this situation where I'm trying to make a communal appeal to African American agency on the one hand, but I'm also trying to make a civic appeal to the American nation on the other. This is why I find so problematic and gratuitously blundering the stance of the NFL athletes vis-a-vis -vis this kneeling at the anthem. And people will get mad at me for saying this. I say this to my students and they don't riot. <laughs> I, I, I say to them, I say to them, wait a minute, I thought we wanted the structures of American society reformed to be more accommodating of the interest of African Americans. Now, how did we think that that was going to happen? We're a democracy. The only way that that happens is you get 50% plus one vote for whatever it is that you're trying to do. Who do you think those people are? So. If I'm, if I'm worried about police uh, violence in cities, and perhaps I shouldn't be so worried, but if I'm worried about it, and I want <laughs> things to change, and I want things to change, how is it that assimilating my protest to a um, expression of contempt for national symbols, how's that effective? Why am I making that the site of my protest? You know, I have a right to protest. Of course you have a right to protest, but it could be a really stupid thing to do. You just gratuitously alienated 30 or 40% of the people who support you need. The cops are killing more white people than black people in this country on a daily basis. Uh, I thought you actually wanted to change it. Or, or, or this guy, Ta-Nehisi Coates, at the, uh, used to write for The Atlantic. He, he, he makes a big case about the case for reparations. They want reparations for slavery. They're not talking to the world court. They're not talking to the United Nations. They're talking to the American people. If there were ever going to be anything in the direction of reparations. It would have to be agreed upon as a national project by Americans. So how is it that out of one side of your mouth you can say America owes black people reparations, and out of the other side of your mouth you can say, in effect, America is a gangster nation full of uh, hooded supremacists for whom we have nothing but contempt. You're not really interested in politics, are you? <laughs> You're interested in performance. You're grandstanding. You're pouting. I want to say to such people. So, so, I mean, I, I've gone a little bit beyond the parameters of the question, but, but <laughs> on, the one hand, on the one hand, these key kids need fathers, and nobody's going to fix that problem but African Americans. On the other hand, the United States of America is a nation state, a diverse nation state full of lots of people, and the stuff that goes on even in the darkest corners of our society is stuff that we all have to own. It's not happening on the moon. It, they didn't import the African Americans uh, from someplace yesterday, and they come in here with all their cultural pathology, born, bred, raised, made in America. Uh, there's a question in the back. Um, hi, my name is Chloe Valdry. Um, I just have a slight disagreement and then a question. Uh, I disagree with the notion that there isn't a debate in the black community. I mean, obviously, I think on a political level, perhaps it's not happening, but on a cultural level, if you were to pull up, for example, The Breakfast Club, you could listen to debates going on between cultural figures over this very issue, including education and the importance of other things that we need in our community. Okay. So I guess my question is, to what extent is politics upstream from the culture, and can that cultural moment happening right now in the black community be used to foster more of these conversations, whether it's in academia or ultimately in the political space? Okay, well, I stand corrected and thank you. It may be that I'm just not as uh, aware as I should be of all of the uh, discourse that's going on amongst African Americans. I have heard about The Breakfast Club, but I, have, I don't spend a lot of time there, I'll confess. Um, I'm kind of pessimistic, and I want to be wrong about this. Uh, I see uh, pretty much what uh, Jason has described in, amongst political actors is that uh, there's not a whole lot of room for, um, for deviation or discussion. Uh, Hillary Clinton brings the mothers of the movement uh, to her uh, convention in 2016. These are mothers of youngsters who died at the hands of the police in one way or another. And it's supposed to be self-evident that that's an embrace of uh, you know, the right side of history, of righteous causes and whatnot. And um, 
I, you know, uh, maybe that's not the best example. Uh, Jasper Williams, the preacher who gave the eulogy at Aretha Franklin's funeral, mm -hmm. dares to call attention. That had to be one of the cultural moments, at, right? Uh, dares to call attention to, uh, you know, the absence of fathers. And he says, you know, how is this, a woman going to raise an adolescent boy to be a man? And so forth. And without trying to get into a fight about, you know, single mothers who have a very uh, tough road to hoe and their capacities to raise their sons to be, uh, uh, to be uh, well-functioning adults. Uh, he was trying to raise a question that I thought should be raised. The last time I looked, a ton of bricks fell on him. Uh, he, was a, he was a Uncle Tom Coon in the, at uh, theroot.com, the last time I looked. Uh, so uh, I'm not so uh, optimistic, but I, I'd like to be wrong about that. So please, uh, you know, tell me I'm wrong and tell me why. Well, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you, Professor Lowry. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I was told that we're going to take a very, very quick break just to set up the chair for the next panel. So, uh, so thank you. We'll continue in a moment. Good morning once again. I'm Howard Husick, Vice President for Policy Research at the Manhattan Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome a panel of respondents to discuss the points that uh, Jason Riley and Glenn Lowry have just explored in that really, really stimulating in interview. Uh, you know, Professor Lowry did himself a disservice by saying that there are only a few people like Thomas Sowell who are raising the deep questions. It's clear that he's doing exactly that, and we were fortunate to have him with us this morning. Uh, I'm joined now by a panel, uh, quite diverse political scientists, an undergraduate student, and an educator to think about both some of the questions that were explored in the first panel, but also to think about the bigger question of what would progress look like and how do we make it to take a constructive uh, look forward. Uh, to my immediately left, uh, my immediate left, Dr. Michael Fortner is an assistant professor of political science at the CUNY Graduate School. He's the author of a terrific book called The Black Silent Majority. Uh, which was featured here in a talk with Jason Riley. Uh, he's uh, received his PhD from Harvard and uh, political science undergraduate degree from Emory. Coleman Hughes is an undergraduate student at Columbia right now who is uh, writing prominently in a number of national outlets, including uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he asked me one of the most provocative questions that was ever asked me at a recent event, so I'm sure that he'll be provocative today. <laughs> okay. And Ian Rowe is the, uh, uh, is the uh, head, CEO, founder, Public Prep, a group of charter schools uh, here in New York City, uh, which has, have predominantly African-American populations. Uh, and they dared to have single gender uh, charter schools. And uh, he himself is a graduate of uh, Brooklyn Tech, BS in computer science engineering from Cornell and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. So it's a great group. And uh, I want to start, uh, Michael, with a point that was raised somewhat in passing uh, by uh, Glenn and Jason about black political leadership. You explored that question in the Black Silent Majority. I know you're continuing to think about it. Uh, Glenn made the point that uh, there's not enough debate. Where is the debate in the black political leadership? How do you assess? the state of that political leadership. So I adore Larry and agree with almost everything that he said today and, and, and usually says. But I, I, there's a bit of a disagreement on this issue that came up earlier. And that is, I do think there is a huge debate among African Americans about, this, about these issues. Um, if you look at survey data on a host of uh, policy questions, most African Americans are where Glenn Lowry's paper sort of has outlined. Um, the problem I think we have is that black political elites, for some reason, are not responsive to the will of black folk. Um, for example, uh, if you look at the question of um, single parents, right, and you look to cultural elites, political elites, there's a very different discourse that, than the one going on in African American communities. If you go to any black church, most black churches, on a Sunday morning, you will hear men ought to be fathers. We need fathers in the home. Now that's not part of the discourse of 
um, African American political elites, but it is part of the discourse in communities. The same about crime, and this is what I, this is what I wrote about. African Americans obviously oppose police brutality, but they also support public safety. They realize that violence, um, drug addiction, drug trafficking in their communities poses a threat to their safety, um, to the safety of their children, um, and they support a robust police response. That's not what black political elites are talking about right now. That's not what whites on the left are talking about right now. For example, I was at a conference on policing, and there was a session where this theater group um, talked about activities in which they tried to bring members of, of the black community and the police department together through acting. And there was a middle-aged black woman in the audience from the Bronx who said, we've been doing these type of things. These things are amazing. We need more of it. A few minutes later, a young white woman um, on the left, uh, she, she stood up as she was angry, and she said, wait a second, why are we here promoting a relationship between black folk and their oppressors? And I'm sitting there like, sister, did you not hear the black lady just now? <laughs> you know, like, where are you getting this? Um, and, and, you know, it's this intellectual stream where everyone has read the new Jim Crow, um, where everyone, um, you know, loves, worships Brother Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, and a black leadership um, that feels that it must follow the lead of, the, of that ideological direction that consistently, I would argue, fails black communities who um, are constantly embracing sort of the good sense, sort of pragmatic policies at a pragmatic middle ground. Right, and you like to make the point that you talk about the racialized right. nature of black leadership. Right. What does that do to the black community? Well, in, in part, what it does, well, first I think there are, um, and again, this may be the difference between an economist and a political scientist. Um, Glenn made the point or proposed the question, don't, don't you think there would be incentives to sort of go against the grain? Right. Um, I'm not sure that's the case um, in African-American politics where um, you need to sort of stand out. And how do you stand out? How do you compete with each other? How do you compete with white politicians? Well, you use race and you try to be more authentic. And so you go to the extreme, and there is, I, I would argue, a huge incentive to a type of racial politics that's not representative of the views and dispositions of everyday black folk. I promise I'm gonna to get to democracy and, and, and public prep and, and all of that because that's where we really wanna concentrate. But I, I gotta bring in Coleman here, because we had that really interesting question for the back of the room about debate among young people. So there you are, you're in the middle of it. Is it isolating to be someone who has culturally based concern, shall we say, a la Glenn Lowry's, in the hothouse of Columbia? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, it's isolating. I, um, you just said, yes, it's isolating, very matter-of-factly. Yeah, I did, because mm -hmm. I don't, uh, as a matter of personal psychology, I find it bad to dwell in, in the stance of, oh, I'm isolated, I'm, you know, I'm going against the grain. It, the more I think about it, the more it depresses me and makes me want to not speak, so I try to not complain. <laughs> but no, but, 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 but most of what you hear, I mean, the but, most- but, but the young woman in the back was saying, well, no, there, there is a robust breakfast club debate, all of that, there's, there's, there's uh, you, green shoots of change. You're, 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 um, not, you're not giving her any help. I mean, I'm an, I'm an N of one, so a sample of one. So I, my experience at, at Columbia is that almost any time, if I'm meeting a, a person, a, you know, stranger, the typical Columbia student, by the way, most kids don't think about politics. Most kids think about the internship they're trying to get this summer, the, the date they went on last week or whatever. But when the conversation does turn to politics, the, the, the received view, the framing of the conversation is that America is a racist patriarchy. And you can make nuanced point, po points from that starting place, but you can't ch challenge the, the fundamental premise. Um, 
And if you do, as I've done in, in, in many a room, it can derail the whole night. It can make what was a fun social. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've ruined nights like this. So, uh, so that, that is true. Obviously, I, 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 I think all of this, when filtered through social media, looks worse than it actually is because you get the worst versions and face-to-face -face interactions tend to go better, not, not always, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it's isolating. Ian Rowe, we're dwelling in barriers. The title of this talk, of this event, is Barriers to Black Progress. Mm -hmm. You are, it's, I think it's fair to say, about overcoming barriers to black progress. Are you optimistic about that occurring? Well, one point I want to make. No, no, I wanted to ask oh, Ian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm curious what you think, but uh, <clears throat> because I run schools, I'm optimistic. Um, so the network I run, you know, we are a single sex network, uh, ele elementary and middle public schools uh, in the heart of the South Bronx um, and in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So our kids, uh, you know, join us at four years old and leave us at 12 or 13 years old. So we have an opportunity to build the foundation for how our students think about their future. Um, and that their future is not destiny, that these bleak outcomes that they're hearing over and over and over again aren't necessarily in their future because they actually have the power to change that course. And that's what I always uh, find amazing, that there is this obsession with uh, the bleak outcomes, particularly in the black community, and you see it in the charts uh, in Glenn's paper. But there's a story of By the success. way, the paper will be available at uh, shortly after this event, we promise. Right. So, Check the website. Right. So there is a story of success. So, you know, last year I did an event uh, focused on the economic success of black men in America. Because lo and behold, there's actually a growing class of successful black men. And this, this study tried to reverse integrate, well, what's, what was common about these men and their experiences that their outcomes are so vastly different from the general narrative? And the, the outcomes were not that surprising, probably to most people in the room, that for the most part, these men followed what is often re referred to as the success sequence, right? So they finished their education, they got a full-time job, uh, which, you know, they learned the dignity and discipline of work, they got married, and then they had children, in that order. Um, and there are studies that show if, if a kid grows up in a low-income family and follows those steps, only 6% will end up in poverty. That's critical information that kids need to know about the power that they can have over their own lives. What's also interesting about that study, the economic success of black men in America, there are a couple other points in addition to the success sequence, which is that um, military um, involvement was sometimes correlated to success, as well as having a faith commitment. But one of the number one elements was that these men had a sense of personal agency that they felt that their decisions actually had the greatest influence over their personal destiny. That's extraordinary. And so if you're a kid and you keep hearing over and over and over and over and over and over that because of your race, these are the outcomes that you're gonna have in your life, it's really hard to feel a sense of personal agency. So it's really critical that people in schools counter that force and remind you of the personal agency, the control that you have but, but in your own life. But is doesn't message mean, enough? It is doesn't message mean, enough? Right, so you're, you're on the front lines in the schools. We've been talking about, and, and Glenn talked about, uh, the overwhelming nature and the failure of public schools, right? I'm guessing that message is just the foundation. You can do it. What about how you actually conduct class do school makes your outcomes better, because they are, than what happens in neighboring public schools in the South Bronx? Well, I mean, first of all, it does start with a mindset that you can do it, that you can't keep reiterating the failure of public schools. There are some public schools that are doing great, right, with the very communities that we're talking about. And we do need to understand why. So, um, so for example, in our schools, um, we now have a class for our exiting eighth graders called Pathways to Power. And pathways to power, particularly for, and this is now for our girls, um, because our boys aren't yet up through eighth grade, but they will, but we'll have the same content for them. 
is that we teach a class on the outcomes th that are associated with different series of life choices, right? So, for example, our school in the South Bronx, or schools in the South Bronx, it's a community where, for women 24 and under who are having children, somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of those births are to are outside of marriage. That was 80 to 90 percent. Correct for women 24 and under, and to go even one step further, about 41 percent of those young women 24 and under who are having uh, children in a given year, it's their second through their eighth child, right? So it's a very large population <coughs> of very young single mothers raising very young children, often multiple children under the age of five. That's a path that if our kids are surrounded by that, they may not necessarily know that there are other paths that have a much greater likelihood of success so we have to embed that in the curriculum for what we teach our kids. We're not moralizing, we're not blaming the victim, we're just sharing realistic data um, that's usually a counterbalance to what they may be seeing personally in their lives. In other words, as important as, as it is to teach algebra well, it's, you gotta do this other stuff too in your situation. I don't see what other choice. In my view, it's actually irresponsible uh -huh. for schools not to teach this kind of information because it's almost sentencing our kids to the same reality that they're seeing across. And by the way, this is not just for black kids. This is for skyrocketing non-marital birth rates in the white community, Hispanic community, the issues we're seeing with the opioid crisis and others. These issues are now more universal, not centered just in the black community. And it's really important we stress that these are human behaviors. These are elements of human development that I think are really critical to underscore. You talked about how pernicious it is to get a message that failure is preordained, or I, I'm guessing you would assume, you would agree that racism is, is an insurmountable barrier. That, that would not be a message you, you want your kids to get either. Well, the, the, that's why we talk about things like the economic success right. of black people in America. I want to bring out a point in, in, in Glenn's paper that struck me as very original and we haven't talked about yet, which is uh, cultural complicity. Right? And so, in a sense, the way I understood the point was not only is racism not a thing, but kind of uh, a, a reverse kind of soft bigotry, patronization, and Glenn used that word, it is a problem. So it's okay for rappers to use the N word. It's okay for that kind of, those kind of cultural displays to, to be norms. And, and Coleman, I wonder how you experience that kind of white tolerance, and do you see it as linked to dysfunction in the black community? Um, yeah, well, I think it, it's a kind of double think, and Glenn pointed this out and others have pointed this out, that uh, there are many progressive whites in this country that will say, well, I'll, I'll have bourgeois values, middle class values for my kids, middle class norms for my kids, but we will, uh, we will send the social media mob after anyone who, like Amy Wax, points out that it's just those values that are most needed in, uh, in in the low income minority communities that are having these uh, bad economic and social outcomes. So it's a kind of double think. And I think Glenn, Glenn was also right to point out that m all the social incentives facing them are to not talk about the problem, to not talk about the problem of culture. Um, and like, as you mentioned, when, it, you know, like, when I brought uh, when I brought this up at the at the debate you had with with Richard Rothstein, we 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 can't summarize that whole debate. It was about it's on YouTube. <laughs> right? it's on YouTube. Because that'll be another another panel. But uh... the, the point I made was that uh, Martin Luther King, in, in his interview for Playboy magazine back when Playboy magazine was doing more important work than it is now, <laughs> he outlined the the SCLC's five goals four of which had to do with ending political oppression of blacks. The fifth goal was what he called addressing the, quote, cultural lag in the black community. And I think a good way to frame this conversation is as one that, that is evaluating the status of Dr. King and the SCLC's fifth goal. And um, it's not, I'm not all that optimistic about how much progress has, the, has been made. Like Glenn, I'm not optimistic about the state of the discourse. I think that um, 
people are terrified to say the wrong thing, um, terrified to think out loud about this problem. And uh, I think we should emphasize that it, it is a problem that uh, Dr. King brought up several times. It is a, is a problem that, ironically, sometimes the more radical you get in terms of Malcolm X and Nation of Islam were more, even, even, even more uh, willing to talk about these kinds of problems and more coherent about it in a way. They, they obviously have an explanation in terms of the slave mentality. That is what, that, that is, what is holding black people back and that's why we're going to go to Africa or whatever it is. So they're, they're, but there's, a, there's, more, there's something more coherent about that, more willing to talk about cultural problems, and um, also more coherent in, in, in the contradiction that Glenn pointed out, namely that if these are the, the white oppressors, if they're so oppressive and so callous, why is it that you're petitioning them? You don't, you don't see that cognitive dissonance among the black nationalist types. They'll say, no, they are the oppressors, and that is why we're not petitioning them. It's up to us, so we're going to leave. Obviously, I don't agree with those conclusions, but it's more internally coherent. Mm. Michael, how did this kind of racialized politics in which, I mean, let's take Al Sharpton as a right. kind of a quintessential right. figure, right? right? How, how does he come to be, and I know you're thinking about this specifically in the context of the history of, of New York. If, if black leadership is doing a disservice to black people, how did that come about? So I would like to, if I can, Please. just briefly uh, address this issue about the discourse and, and white liberals. Um, because I spent the last three years with my book getting beat up by white liberals. Um, and, 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 I could, and, I could, and I love them dearly. Um, they're some of my best friends. Um, I <laughs> but you don't patronize them. <laughs> but, right, but, right, but uh, and, 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 and the entire time, Right, I would I would be talking about black agency, right, and and so of course it's sort of structured agency, but black folk have power; they can make decisions, um, and and I mentioned this the last time I was here, and and white liberals would just come up to me and tell me I'm wrong, that I don't know black folk, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and they would they would sort of say, you don't understand how awful white people can be. And my thinking, I'm starting to, right? <laughs> and, 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 and it, it, but it is this sort of, sort of patronizing, it's this sort of patronizing, like I, for some reason, know the truth, right? And this is sort of the gospel um, that I'm embracing, and you are offensive to it. And I need to not disagree with you, but I need to discredit you. Um, I need to sort of undermine um, the whole enterprise that you're attached to. Um, and so I think if we're going to move um, beyond the barriers, we're going to need for um, sort of the intellectual elites, white intellectual elites, to be uh, more pluralistic um, in their approach to knowledge and, and to these questions. Right. And so getting back to my Al Sharpton question, yes. which is not unrelated, I think, do, you really want me to talk about Brother No, Adam? no, no, no. <laughs> you, you, you can talk about, okay. we right. can depersonalize it. Okay. Right, but, but is white liberalism a foundation of that politics? Well, it's supportive of that. I mean, I, one of the things that um, amazes me as someone who grew up in New York is... He grew up in Brownsville. Brownsville, Brooklyn, right. In a NYCHA project. That, it, that, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is true. That, that accounts for the brain damage. That's right? exactly <laughs> right. But something wrong with me. Um, no, no. So in, in New York, um, and, and to sort of think about how far Al Sharpton has come on the left um, is amazing to me. Um, he, you know, he was an extremely controversial figure in the city of New York, even um, among African Americans. But I think his um, recent success, show appearances on MSNBC, is a testament to um, th the content of contemporary white liberalism and the extent to which they embraced that type of identity politics in a way that they had not done 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, turn to, to Ian Rowe, charter schools are in the headlines these days. They were, they were reducing the growth in charter schools. It was one of the demands of the Los Angeles striking teachers. There's a proposed charter school cap uh, in Albany. Glenn Lowry referred to this 
uh, protest at the NAACP convention by black parents about the NAACP's, NAACP's opposition to charter schools. Would you talk about why is there that opposition and why the heck do we need charter schools in the context of overcoming barriers if they are the only way? Right, so great question. So uh, <clears throat> in New York State and, and New York City right now, there are only seven uh, remaining charter uh, charters available. Um, new potential for new schools. Potential for new schools. Uh, we are applying to, to open our second all-girls um, charter school in the Bronx. Last year we had about 4,600 applications for only about 200 uh, open seats um, for our... For Let's just repeat that, would you? About 4,600 applications for about 200 open seats through a random lottery. Um, I, I believe that's more competitive than Harvard. It's, it's unfortunately pretty tough to get into um, our schools, and it is, uh, it's an incredible joy to call um, those 200 families to say that you know, your child has gotten a golden lottery ticket. Um, but it is heartbreaking to call uh, 4,400 families wow. to say that the best we can do is to put your child on an excruciatingly long wait list to get into our school. And that's not just uh, our school. Um, and you know, these are parents that they don't want anything as radical as just the opportunity to send their son or daughter to a great school. Um, why folks would be in opposition to that um, is, is mired probably in union politics and perception of, of who's behind someone like me that runs a charter network that seems to be doing great things for kids. Um, well, by the way, just bracket this. How great are you doing? Now, that was an easy question, right? <laughs> uh, you, know, I, you know, what I, I like to say about our work is that we have a track record of continuous improvement, right? We are constantly trying to be better for our kids. You know, our first, uh, our first school opened in 2005 is the first all-girls public charter school in New York City. That cohort, and we, and we have more graduates and started, which is very important, are now attending some of the finest colleges and universities in the country as freshmen and sophomores at Yale, Cornell, Tufts, um, and I could go on. Are they um, following the success sequence? Uh, I didn't come to that realization until later, so now we're embedding that content. So they'll okay. be doing even better uh, okay. once they have that um, content. But the bottom line is our kids, certainly relative to the very low standards of the existing system, which, by the way, is no great um, hurdle in, the, in the, where our all-boys school is. We just built a beautiful 85,000-square-foot building uh, in the heart of the South Bronx. In that um, uh, district, only 2% of boys who start ninth grade graduate from high school ready for college, meaning Two. that they start ninth grade and either drop out or they do graduate from high school but can't do college level reading or math without remediation. And so I asked Glenn, if I told him this stat, like which is worse, the dropout rate or actually finishing your high school degree but you're still not able to do college level work. So that is embedded low, ex low expectations within the actual curriculum that the school um, is delivering. So why do charter schools exist? Because we should give to parents better options than what um, has existed for them in the past. But why are they so resistant? Is it a sheer, the narrative is it's union self-interest. Is it that simple? That's not the narrative of the 4,600 families that are applying, right? So yes, that, yes, there is a narrative and, and um, you know, uh, Glenn talked about social media and, you know, the power of the anecdote. You know, you can have one negative story about a charter school mm -hmm. that may or may not be true. And by the way, not all charter schools are great. There's some fantastic traditional district schools. So, so charter schools don't have a monopoly on quality, right? And, and we as charter leaders should acknowledge that. But you take one example and it can be exploded to then fall into someone's narrative about how charter schools are somehow you know, making money off the backs of poor kids or, or somehow have some other evil intent. Right. And just, and just one quick story about um, the, the power of anecdotes, because I think this is just a great example. If I were to ask most people in this room, because um, I've been doing this recently, I decided to write an essay about it, who is Michael Brown? Um, most people would probably respond, Michael Brown, isn't that that kid that was shot in Ferguson? Right, that's how most people know that name. And one thing that's interesting, there's another Michael Brown who's also, you know, um, 
it was about the same age as the, that Michael Brown. Wrote a Brown memoir, first, right? No, no, this Michael Brown is a kid in Texas that no one knows about. Oh. Black kid who applied and got into 20 different universities from Stanford, almost all the Ivy Leagues, just incredible story. And you watch, this, you watch the video of him getting his application, I think the acceptance from Stanford, and it, it's infectious, it's, in, it's joyous, it's wonderful. And yet no one knows about this Michael Brown. And yet his story is much more representative of the more than one million um, black men that are in college versus the story of Michael Brown who, from Ferguson, which is a tragedy. But in terms of what they represent, they're far different. But the power of the anecdote and what social media can do, it can create this, this perception of, of an outsized perception of the, this is my reality. My reality is going to be much more like this Michael Brown than the one who got into 20 different universities now in the first leg of the success sequence and the likely greater choices he's going to have in his life. You've talked about uh, success of black males and you've written about it. There's also a sense that black males are peculiarly falling behind black women. Even within the success, relative success of black women, yep. black men are trailing. Is that something that you think about in your school? And, and I'd like to ask the other panelists to respond to the, the general question as well. Uh, again, I, mean, I, I think these are u <clears throat> universal human issues. Of course, I think we think about it all the time. I have an all boys school in the heart of the South Bronx. Um, um, you know, and oftentimes, they are being raised in uh, families, families of which there may not be um, a father present. And again, let me say, let me stipulate that being the child of a single parent is not a guarantee of failure. We have extraordinary uh, single moms and single dads in our schools who are doing incredible things to try and um, get their kid to be successful. And also, if you're a child of a married, you know, two-parent household, that doesn't guarantee success. However, the odds are overwhelming that if you are a child in that situation that we see typically in the South Bronx, the odds are stacked against you. Um, and so, which is why we think it's so incumbent to not reduce our expectations of that child because of the situation that they might be in. We have to, but, right? But what about boys, right? So there, there's, a, there's a narrative out there that the economic opportunities for men that they used to have in the labor market have declined, that there's all sorts of things that are stacked against men, right. and those, that black men are, are, the, are, the, are the tail of that even more disadvantaged. That's undeniable. The, the question again is, again, I'm an educator, so I focus on what can we do with the next generation who haven't yet encountered these issues, right? That is a reality. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Right. right? Are you going to succumb to the pressure and say, you see that? Did you see, I'm a seven-year-old, did you see that chart that shows that I'm, you know, my, my outcomes are, are destined to be worse? Why bother even trying, right? So you need a, a, a counterbalance to say that it's going to be hard because of your race, because, you're, because of whatever. You might have cancer. Like your life, life, whatever, life has adversity of which maybe being of a certain racial group might give you certain um, other barriers, but you're the greatest uh, decider within your, the, the, the course of your own life. And for me, that is, I feel, a very privileged and honorable position to be running schools, because that's the message we've got to give, despite all of those real statistics. I don't think anyone is denying the outcomes, the bleak outcomes that do exist. The question is, what are we preparing our, the next generation for how they think about how to tackle those. Who shows up in your classes? Do you, do you have uh, African-American students, and how are they making it to the CUNY Graduate Center? I don't have many at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, most of the students at the Grad Center are um, white um, um, on the left, um, and so it's not an extremely diverse crowd, although we're trying to um, make inroads in um, more minority communities. Right now, I didn't mean to put you on the defensive no, about no, right, that. Right. I'm trying to figure out like why. This I want to get a call from my department chair. Yeah. After this. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Right. Right. No, uh, no, I mean, but if I can, um, go back to the, the, the other question about w what do we what do we do about it? Although CUNY um, is uh, working hard to deal with this problem, um, so. 
um, President Obama had this initiative, My Brother's Keeper, right? Um, that tried to tackle some of this by building mentoring relationships and other opportunities for young black males. Um, a lot of black intellectuals took him to task for they that. They did. Took him to task for that. Now, again, it's, a, it's an empirical question whether or not these things work, but my concern as a political scientist is sort of where, um, where are black folks on this issue and then where is the political system on this issue? And the political system, right, um, in, in terms of white and black elites are not where black folks were. They were where Obama was. And black folks are constantly craving more opportunities for their son, for mentoring, for better sort of educational institutions. And there is a discourse um, among black and white uh, elites on the left that this is somehow um, fundamentally problematic. Um, that, it's sexist? Well, it's sexist, but also that it, it, it focuses too much on behavior and uh -huh. not enough on, on structure. And um, Structural racism. Structural racism, right. Um, and the Obama, uh, President Obama's response was that, look, it's, he believes it's you know, some proportion of structure, some proportion of culture. Why don't we try everything, including this? Um, and again, whether that's right or wrong, that's where most black folk are, but that's not where the sort of the democratic policy establishment is on a lot of these questions. Right, and you're just constantly making that point between right. what we might call the black working class right. and, and the black elites. That's right. theme. Yes, Colby. Right. I add to that. I, I, so you're, you're pointing out this uh, disjunction between what black people, when polled, actually believe, which is far more socially conservative. Right. than is generally expected and what uh, political elites say and asking why aren't they reflecting the opinions of the uh, political elite. Um, John McWhorter, the writer John McWhorter, he had a book called Authentically Black from maybe 16 years ago, roughly, where he, one of the threads of the book is that um, there's a sense among black people that what you say around black people versus when you're around white people, you should not be sending the same message. Around black people, it's OK to say, uh, we need fathers in the home. What is this crazy business about if, you, if you're into math and into reading that you're acting white? What well, you're allowed to say, though, encouraged to say those in church or uh, around black people. But the moment white people can hear, uh, we need to feel that we need to keep them feeling that they are on on the hook to us from a policy perspective, and that's mm -hmm. a huge. That this is the sense. This is not something I, I agree with. But um, if that is the attitude, then it would make sense for for it's not just that the political elites are ignoring necessarily uh, the black constituency. It, it could be that they're being penalized for not obeying that double standard. And the last point I would make about that is... Um, and so they're reluctant to do it because of that. Yeah, and, and to the extent that they do do it, like My Brother's Keeper, um, they are penalized for not obeying the law about what you're... The dirty laundry rule. But I'll say one thing implicit, to the extent that that attitude is uh, pervasive among black people, which seems plausible, I, I guess I wonder what, what the rest of you think, it's, it's an implicit recognition of the fact that as... Professor Lowry would say, nobody is coming to save us. Uh -huh. It's an implicit recognition that the reason we can't, we can't talk about uh, uh, fatherless homes when white people can hear is because they can't do anything about it. Because it would, it, would, it would make sense to talk about it around white people if they could do, about it, do, do something about it. But we know somehow deep down that it's up to us. And the things that they can do are perhaps related to other policies. Right. So well, I think, I'm oh, sorry. Well, I was so that gets back to, to, uh, to Jason's question is, should we look to public policy in any, in any way? It may, go, go ahead with what you were going to say. So I think for some time there was, even with my book, there were some people who thought, you know, this is dirty laundry. Uh, we know this, but mm -hmm. the rest of the world, right. Does and, not and, and the book was basically working class black right. people push for tough, tough crack right. cocaine laws. That's right. Um, and uh, created conditions for the passage of the Rockefeller drug laws, um, and I, and I think that's somewhat true. But but I, but we but there's also a group of very important black intellectuals who don't embrace that argument at all. 
who fundamentally think that, um, who have different opinions from sort of working class, middle class African Americans, and then ascribe their views onto this population. Uh -huh. um, there was a there was a someone who um, was writing about criminal justice. I'm not going to mention the book, but um, they went after me in the, in the footnote. And the point that this person made was that instead of going to police, um, she said, "We know that um, blacks and Latinos turn to gangs." for their protection. And I thought, why would you write something like that? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard, right? Imagine a white conservative said that black folk hate the police and instead turn to gangs. We would be rioting over something like that. We would be protesting over something like that. But you can have this argument um, in which the, the racial order, white supremacy, is so overwhelming to make ordinary black folk do things that we might think are sort of strange, uh, but make sense within this theory. And, and I think there's a devotion to this theory now, to this approach, to this um, structure argument that I've never seen um, you know, over, you know, over the last 20 years. And it forgives all sorts of misbehavior, if you will. It ignores them, or it, or it completely sort of just says, Sort of, it's the structure, everything. And again, and it's it, and for me, and I love black folk. Um, I know sort of race is a, a social um, construction, um, but but I'm black as can be, um, and and and, I, and I'm happy about that. But what what's so weird is that um, a lot of the, these structural arguments sort of force black folk to be either extraordinary or crazy. <laughs> you know, I'm just sort of like my work is about how black folk are just like everybody else. We make mistakes like everybody else. We believe certain things like everybody else. We may be wrong or right, but we need to be understood within, I think, theoretical frameworks and tools that allows the individual, allows sort of our own sort of cultural heritage to, to breathe through and not have these structural arguments that sort of dismisses everything that's interesting um, about black folk. And, and that's what the structural argument that we're now seeing does, and I think that's dangerous. Right, I got one last question. I'm getting the time signal here. But uh, Ian, uh, on this public policy point, what do we look for for public Well, certainly the, the permission to operate a charter school is a public policy issue. But when we spoke on the phone, you said something that really caught my attention. Norms swamp policy, you said. Could you elaborate on that? <clears throat> well, it's just this idea that culture, I think someone oh, referred, you know, culture, cultural norms, they do overwhelm policy. I mean, you can, you can shower um, an entire community with public dollars, but if there's a fundamental disconnect of the responsibility of men within that same community, it's really hard to see how that is going to overturn. Um, and, and you cannot look at the last uh, 50 years, you know, since the Moynihan Report or the Coleman Report in education or Yuri Bronfenbrenner in the late 60s. Um, urban, uh, urban development who were saying these things that public policy matters, but we've got some other issues here, particularly around family structure, the, the role of men that will become its own pathology, mm -hmm. regardless of how the structural racism may have caused these conditions now. Right. But the power of fatherless homes unto itself becomes the perpetuator. And um, I think our history has shown we've made it enormous investments in trying to turn around the outcomes. And again, not just of black folks, but low-income folks across race, that we have still not seen the desired outcomes. And so this recognition is not to repudiate whatever structural barriers do still exist, but we have to be honest and recognize that these cultural forces, particularly around the formation and the timing of family structure, um, is critical to achieve the outcomes I know that we're all committed to achieve. I, I've got a book coming out that says the government really can't set the norms. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, that's not true. I mean, I think the, a, a president... <laughs> um, Sorry, brother. <laughs> I mean, nor, norms, do, norms do come from a lot of places. You know, Yuri Bronfenbrenner, um, the father of Head Start and his eco-biological theory, you know, has this uh, idea of human development where a child it, it you know, exists within a series of concentric circles, right? And their view on the world 
is shaped by their most micro system, which is primarily their family. And the strength of that unit then allows them to buffer from other forces, whether it be media, popular culture, government. But if that is not strong, then how norms are shaped can go in all sorts of negative ways. And so there is a role for a president who can be a bully pulpit and talk about family. You know, you can, policy makers can talk about things that are not policy and still advance the causes of policy, right? I, I think an ideology that assumes that every solution must be wrapped up in Albany or Washington right. is, is a failed one. I guess I'm seeing the charter school as a civil society kind of a thing too because you got philanthropic support and you're in the norm shaping business. I mean, we just built a $30 million um, you know, building in the Bronx and it was a very unique example of public and private financing. Right. So it's a great example of how public policy can be a lever but not the only lever. We got a couple minutes for questions, and then I'm going to invite Glenn Lowry to come back and be a respondent to the respondents. And I'm trying to see somebody. Uh, yeah, yeah, right here in the middle. Which one? If you asked a question last time, I'm not. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can't see. I got bright lights. Uh, David Musher, I have a question for a fellow uh, Brooklyn Tech uh, alumnus. Go engineers. Okay. Um, there is a curriculum that comes out of Chapel Hill uh, that can be applied to schools um, across the board in various um, studies um, where there are instances of chronic, um, maybe hereditary, uh, congenital unemployment. Uh, we've taken that curriculum to Israel, where it's been very successful. And you, ha you talked about a course um, which is called Pathways of Power. My question to you is, is there such a curriculum for personal agency that can be applied in a mathematics course, an English composition course, a history course? In other words, instead of having an independent course uh -huh. on individual agency, is there a curriculum that can be applied across the board? That's a great, that's a great question. So the reason I talk about Pathways to Power, it, A, it's so unique, and, and we're still evolving it, trying to make it better, but that's the goal. By, by demonstrating that there's a school brave enough to even take on these issues, I'm hoping to inspire other charter leaders, district leaders, private school leaders to say, how could we incorporate those, these same elements that we're talking about in what we call Pathways to Power, but embed that throughout the curriculum, right? Because the, the whole idea is to infuse this idea that whether it's mathematics or science, there, there are pathways, um, there is history of human development and that there's certain pathways that are better than others. There's certain pathways that lead to chronic unemployment and there are others that lead to chronic employment and shouldn't our kids um, know the difference. And by the way, great Brooklyn Tech. Um, um, I loved my time uh, at Brooklyn Tech. You know, it's one of the uh, specialized high schools in New York, um, which right now are under assault um, in terms of the criteria that could be utilized to um, get into these great schools. And why not just build more specialized high schools and increase the quality of education that kids are receiving pre-K through eighth grade so that all kids are better prepared to get into more great high schools. I th okay, one more question, and I'm going to bring Glenn, then Lowry, uh, uh, back up. Okay, right in the middle there. I, I apologize, but uh, I did want to ask a question, and you pointed to me, and someone gave him the microphone. But uh, let me let me ask my question, which is, I want to try to tie together the success model and no one's coming here to help us, or who is coming here to help save us? Save us. Uh, save us. Um, the success model, I think, becomes intuitively obvious. And a lot of the conversation today has been, how do you get the bottom of the funnel to uh, really improve? I think there's another way to think about it is, how do you get the top of the model to be more visible and more widespread? So and to make that in the form of a question, can, no, no, the most, can, I, can the most successful be a model for the least successful? 
Well, yes, but let me go a little further because I wanted to. Well, I'm looking for the question. Jesus, come on. This is a democracy, isn't it? Um, so what I, what I think is, from my own experience, there is a massive amount of support for that success model that exists in corporate America. And I think there are widespread amounts of funds that are available to invest in that. Um, I've experienced it uh, in many places. And I just think that that is a, a profitable way to uh, look at this uh, question also. It's not dispositive. From your lips Thank to God's you. ears. There, there is a, uh, it is quite controversial to talk about the things that I'm talking about uh, within a public education setting. To talk about these series of life decisions, education, work, marriage, then children, as a suggested order that more likely leads to success is highly controversial. And I encourage uh, philanthropists, foundations to invest um, to make it OK versus more of a victimization kind of ideology that seems to attract more funds. OK, so I'm going to invite Glenn Lowry to come back. If, why don't we just stay here? Please join me in thanking our panel, yeah. And what, we'll just stay here to make it easy. And if, if you don't mind taking the podium, Glenn, that'd be great. OK, I had my turn. I'm not going to give a big speech. Thanks uh, to the excellent panel. I mean, there were many, uh, I think, important things said. Uh, let me review the bidding. I, I've got a note here. Urgency, agency, and honesty. And that's how I'd like to frame my reaction to this entire experience this morning. This is urgent. These things that we're talking about are absolutely fundamentally important to the health of American democracy. <clears throat> we can't let this fester unaddressed. It's only going to get worse. You saw what happened in Ferguson? It's going to get worse. You saw what happened in Baltimore? It's going to get worse. If we don't find a way effectively as a polity to address ourselves to these matters, we're in deep doo-doo, as George uh, Herbert Walker Bush once said. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's point number one. Point number two, I heard Barack Hussein Obama's name mentioned only once in reference to uh, my brother's keeper up here. I blame Barack Hussein Obama for Al Sharpton. Barack Hussein Obama created Al Sharpton as a national figure with the reach and the influence that he has. I'm sorry, can we be honest? about the former president, whom I admire as a human being greatly, fumbling of the race portfolio during his eight years in office. He was elected and celebrated as the first African-American president. Nobody could have changed that narrative any more than he might have done. He elected not to do that. When civil disorder broke out in Ferguson, Missouri, and in Baltimore, Maryland, he basically winked and nodded at it, rather than standing up for law and order as the President of the United States ought to have done. Having done so as an African American would have made a, hu a, a huge difference in the tenor of the discourse on this issue. I'm sorry, I know that this is not necessarily a universally shared view. But if you want to talk about politics and political leadership on racial issues and you elect a black man, President of the United States, and he puts Al Sharpton in charge of the race portfolio for our country, he has not done his job correctly, in my opinion. Okay. So I think that that needed to be said. I wish that um, when uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, issues had broken out, that the president had been uh, more willing. I wish that to, more willing to stand up for um, the uh, uh, universal values that are, uh, uh, that are at stake uh, when people go into the streets on nonsense. Hands up, don't shoot. We all know that that was not actually what happened there. Roland Fryer, in his analysis, his careful analysis of the uh, data on uh, police violence, finds what he finds, which is that uh, uh, with respect to lethal violence, there isn't any evidence, at least in the city of Houston, at systematics, after systematic study or in the uh, stop and frisk data that he got for New York City, that there was this uh, epidemic of uh, lethal violence against African Americans. You don't go into the streets and burn down. You don't, you don't mass in front of courthouses and demand that juries produce results. Suppose that that was done every time an African-American felon 
murderer or criminal had uh, victimized somebody, that you had mobs in front of courthouses demanding, quote unquote, justice, close quote, et cetera. I won't go on. Uh, I want to I want to I want to raise a couple of other points. Where's the church in this discussion? Martin Luther King's name got mentioned. Morality used to actually mean something. You used to be able to say to young women, three, four, five babies by the time you're 30 years old with three different fathers is no way to live. It's wrong. Not just counterproductive, not just inconsistent with success. It's wrong. When I say cultural complicity in my paper, what I'm talking about is the fact that the plight of low-income African-American communities is in part the consequence of American society's uh, structures. Uh, the uh, uh, contempt for uh, religious devotion that is characteristic of, uh, of political elites running op-ed pages and running political campaigns in this country. I'm not just talking about the anti-Catholic bias that you've seen recently because Trump wants to appoint some Catholics to the Supreme Court. I'm talking about the fact that Malcolm X is a more celebrated figure than Martin Luther King, as a matter of fact, on the streets of many African-American communities in this country. That's an abomination. King's leadership was rooted in his commitment to Christian ministry. That's why there's a monument to him on the Washington Mall. That's why there's a national holiday to him. What he managed to accomplish in the 15 years or so uh, that he was a leader was rooted in his faith. Where am I seeing that being voiced amongst African-American leaders? John Lewis, where are you? What about religion? What about morality? What about appealing to people's duties as well as uh, and their responsibilities as well as their entitlements? Uh, in their victimization. I think that the intellectual framework for discussing these issues is in trouble. I think the only way to correct that is to be honest about the nature of the difficulties. African American youngsters are not underrepresented at the exam schools in New York City because the test is biased. They are not underrepresented at Caltech and MIT because those are racist institutions. They're underrepresented because they have not acquired the human functioning capacities that allows them to compete in those kinds of selective, rarefied, competitive venues. If we don't address that problem, again, as I say, we're destined to be living in a universe of patronizing, soft bigotry of low expectations and excuse making for African Americans. I'm mad about this. Me, Glenn Lowry, personally. I'm pissed off about it. It's a travesty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lowry. I also want to thank our, our panelists for the wonderful job. Uh, Howard, uh, I want to thank my Manhattan Institute colleagues for helping put this together, particularly uh, 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 Michael Hendricks, um, and um, uh, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. I wish um, our discussions of race were as comprehensive uh, as the one we had today. Unfortunately, um, they're not, but um, that's to start somewhere. So thank you again for coming, and have a good day. Thank you.